For tapes of end-time meetings, deliverance services, or Lake Hamilton Bible Campgrounds publication, Voices from His Excellent Glory, Declaring the Kingdom, writes Post Office Box 21516, Hot Springs National Park, Arkansas, zip 71903. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. There are many free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. Saturday morning, May the 23rd, 1981, Lake Hamilton Bible Camp, Hot Springs, Arkansas. Memorial Weekend Deliverance Seminar with George Leroy of Toronto, Canada. Hallelujah. Holy Spirit, we welcome thy presence this day as we uplift Jesus Christ. We pray that Lord shall draw all men unto him. And then, Father, as we go into the word of God, we pray for the truth that you have for us this day. We thank and praise you for what you're doing inside of our lives. For we feel the presence of the kingdom within us. We thank you, Lord, for the Holy Ghost that is building and developing in us the image of Jesus Christ. And we pray this morning that, Father, as we reach out to you, that you undertake to bring to us the life in the Holy Ghost. For without you we are nothing. And Lord, as we begin to move into the presence of your Spirit, we pray you'll captivate our hearts and our minds, and we take authority over all principalities and powers. We take authority over every hindering spirit of hell. We stand in the gap and we believe, Father, we have the authority in Jesus Christ to resist the enemy and he'll flee from us. And so we take authority over Satan and we command that he let the people of God go and we pray for a flowing out of truth this morning into every heart and every mind. And Father, we'll be pleased to give you all the praise and the honor and glory for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. How many brought their Bibles this morning? Praise the Lord. I want you to turn with me to the, uh, in the Word of God, to the book of Colossians, and we'll go uh, different places as the Lord will lead us. I'll get into the charts, I promise. Uh, I believe the Lord's just kind of laying a little foundation for us, so that by the time we get into some of the charts, you and I will know and have an understanding of what God is doing in our lives. In Colossians, in chapter 1, verses 21, 22, and 23, we read the scriptures. And you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. So we know from that scripture that this is one of the ultimate purposes of God, that he will present us in this condition, holy, unblameable, unreprovable in his sight. Now the verse 23 is important. If is a conditional word, and we see if you continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and it says, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel. Now stop and think of that scripture. If you continue, so there's no turning back. For the Bible says that if you put your hand to the plow and turn back, you are not fit for the kingdom or the authority of the realm of God. And so he says, if you continue in the faith, grounded, and this is what God's trying to do, ground us, settle us. And then he says, Be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which you have heard, which was preached to every creature was under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. Now we know what the hope of this gospel is, for we find it, as we've already said before, a little farther down, verses 26 and 27 and 28. Even the mystery, which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints, to whom, you as saints, God would make known what is the richest, and this means wealth or fullness. So what is the fullness of the glory? There's a glory attached to this mystery, a glory of the mystery of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. All right. 
Verse 28 says, Whom we preach, we're warning every man, teaching every man, in all wisdom, he says, that we may present every man perfect or complete in Christ Jesus. Now, I want you to turn with me to the, to the epistle of 1 John, chapter 3. 1 John, chapter 3, beginning to read at verse 1. Now, this is a mystery that people cannot see. You and I know that Christ is in us. We have that faith. We believe that. But the old enemy, plus the religious system, Babylon itself, is trying and has moved the people of God away from this hope of Christ developing in them and bringing many sons to maturity. Now, that's the devil's job. And we've mentioned before how Satan... Because he was discouraged with one son and wanted to get rid of the Son of God, then he had no idea that God's wisdom and God's plan, that once this son, this pattern son, was crucified, resurrected, that he was going to pour down upon the people of God who believed, place in them his spirit, and begin to develop other sons. And so this was the program of God. Now here in First John chapter 3, we read in the first verse, Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. And here it can be sons, I believe, or children. Sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Now when Judas betrayed the Lord Jesus, he had to kiss Jesus Christ in the garden so the soldiers that were coming would know who Jesus was. Now that tells me something, that Jesus Christ, even with his fullness and the character and the image of God within him, the world was blinded to the revelation that God had placed in this realm. And so he had nothing about him outwardly that looked any different than you or I, or you or myself. And so we see here that they, it says in, in, in the first verse, Behold, what manner of love the Father bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God, therefore the world knoweth us not. It did not know Him, and it does not know us, because you and I walk around in mortal bodies, but there is something taking place on the inside. Something is working on the inside. Now he says in verse 2, Beloved, now are we the children of God, and it doth not yet appear, it hasn't appeared yet, what we shall be. Now what's going to happen? We know that one day, because of our moving on into the things of God, that a transformation, because of this metamorphosis on the inside, there's going to be a transformation, and one day... Something is going to happen to us. This mortal body is going to take on immortality and we are going to be glorified and come into the image of Jesus Christ that is already being developed now on the inside. So he says, Beloved, now we are the children of God and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. So have hope, brother. But you look at yourself now and I want to bring out some other truth on this. You might look and say, God's not doing anything in my life. Well, I have news for you. God is doing something in your life. Whatever, and our sister's already said it, whatever, every time God sets you free from a spirit that was placed in you under the old Adam, that part of you is taken over by the Spirit of God. Now, I know this to be true because when God first brought me into deliverance and God, through divine intervention, set me free... I felt that spirit leave from my chest area as I threw it out, but after it was gone, I felt that area close up. A literal feeling of something filling up that void or the cavity from whence that spirit had gone. So every time God does a work of circumcision by the spirit inside of you, that much more of you is taken over by the spirit of God. So he says here, Beloved, now are we the children of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know. Now, how many know this? But we know that when He shall appear, how many believe He's coming a second time? Amen. Literal, physical, second coming of Jesus. All right. He says here that when He shall appear, what is going to happen? We shall be like Him. Why? 
because the head cannot appear without the body. And so, because of that, we will look and be as he is. The servant cannot be above his master, but he can be as his master. And so he says, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Now, every man, now this is important, every man that hath this hope in him. Now there are some of God's people that do not have the revelation of this, therefore they do not have this hope in them. Their hope is some other hope. But you know, this hope is the mystery of Christ in you. You know that God's working in you. And so he says in verse 3, Every man that hath this hope in him, what's he do? Ah, oh, deliverance. Pur purifieth himself. Why? Even as Jesus Christ was pure. Even as he is pure. That's why he tells us this. Now, I want you to drop down here in this third chapter and look at verse 5. And you know that he was manifested, talking about the Lord Jesus, to do what? To take away or lift our sins. Now, it's a plurality. He's not talking about the sin principle that works in this mortal body. We have that thing working in us, and that gives the devil the ground to tempt us. But you see, he's talking about those sins, those things on the inside that he wants to take and remove from us, take them out of us, so that we can have an overcoming life on the inside and then resist the devil from the outside. And so he talks about it. You know that he was manifested. This is the reason Christ was manifested. To take away our sins. And in him is no sin. Whosoever. Look at that word. Whosoever. Now we use that word for John 3.16. Whosoever believeth on him. Isn't that right? Alright. Those that believe. Whosoever abideth in him. See when you come to Jesus Christ. You know, a son abides always in the house, but a servant's in and out all the time. Under the old covenant, the difference was that when God's people came out of Egypt, they had already been redeemed under the Passover. They had sprinkled the blood on the housetops and on the lintels. They did not put it on the threshold because that would be trampling underfoot the blood. But they came out of Egypt a redeemed people. Is that right? We also know that when they came out of Egypt that they had in type the baptism in the Holy Ghost because the Bible says in Corinthians the rock that followed them was Christ, the anointing. All right, they get into the wilderness, but they found out that the Bible tells us that God took them by way of the wilderness for one purpose. The purpose was to show them what was in the flesh. All right, here they come out of Egypt. They're, they're redeemed. They're under the blood. The Passover. We have that. The Passover. We find Pentecost is mentioned in Corinthians. So I believe that the rock that followed them was the Pentecostal experience. Even though it was in type. Now, they get into the wilderness. We have all of the people of God in the wilderness. Now, they figured, we have, we have our peace with God. And they had their peace with God. Just like you and I have our peace with God. But as they began to get into the wilderness... God began to do things. All things work together for good to them that love God and are called according to His purpose. So what did He do? He allowed certain things to happen in the wilderness to get a response out of their lives. And the response that came was the response of unbelief, doubt, murmuring, complaining, bitternesses. Does that remind you of anything? All right. And so, here's the difference. They had to come to God as God set up this tabernacle of worship, of service, and they had to come to the tabernacle and offer sacrifices for their sins and their trespasses. And God forgave them. Now, bring it into the New Testament. We have some of God's people, Pentecostals, Nazarenes, Baptists, whatever you want to call them, whatever tag name they go under, they have been redeemed. But because of error, and because the truth has not been preached, we have God's people running around sinning just like they did under Old Covenant. They sin, 
And then we have the cop out, and we'll turn to it in First John. Let's look at it, because I don't want to take anything out of context here. First John, in the first chapter, verse 9, he says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so we say, we have an advocate with Jesus Christ, the righteous. My little children, he says in chapter 2, 1 of 1 John, these things write unto you that you sin not. Forget that, because God's people don't believe that. So we'll leave that part out. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And so God's people under new covenant say, well, because I can't live above sin, I can't help it because I have a temper, because I get mad, or because I swear, I can't. So what happens? They keep running to the altar, getting down, say, God, forgive me, and they know that God's grace is sufficient, and so they get up and run out and say, well, God's forgiven me, and they do it all over again. They are no better than Roman Catholics who go to confessional. Come on. Only it's a different priest. But we use this scripture, which is taken out of context, and we use that as an escape route for our sin. Now, under Old Covenant, they couldn't do anything else but sin. The reason being that the New Covenant had not yet come into effect. The difference was that there was no life on the inside of them. That had not happened. The Spirit was with them, we know that, but the Spirit had not come into them. That could not happen until after New Covenant. And so God showed them and brought the law, and when the law came, it was a schoolmaster to drive them to Jesus Christ, to show them a better covenant, with better promises, with a better hope, with a better life. Everything was better. But my God, you look at the church of Jesus Christ today, and you look at God's people today, and I'll tell you some of the testimonies that I've heard in the past, I don't know how in the world I ever got saved listening to them. I don't know how in the world that anybody ever wants to come in, because somebody will stand up and say, I'm just hanging on. It's a rough road, but oh, I'm believing God, and I'm hanging on. And somebody sitting out there who's unsaved, and they think, well, man, if you're just hanging on, I'm not. I'm enjoying life. And so that's a poor advertisement. And then they go into some of the Christian homes, and they see husbands and wives battling with each other. They hear criticisms. They see the murmurings and the backbitings and all of these things. They see their young people, their children, away from God, into drugs and doing all, all the rebellion there. And they say, well, what is it any different now? Then what I've got, an unsaved Christian, an unsaved person. So what's the difference? The difference is that under new covenant, God, through His grace, not only forgives, but He puts His life on the inside to take out those things that we have been programmed with by the devil when we were in Egypt so that we can live and walk above sin, and have nothing on the inside to hinder our walk in God. They never had it under Old Covenant, but we have it under New Covenant. But the problem has been that the church has missed the truth of it, and they have moved the people of God away from it and said, well, this is the cop-out. Now let's look at First John chapter 1 for a moment. And I'll get to wherever I'm going as God leads. I have been like this for a long time, so I don't know what's happening in this campground. But anyway, we'll go with this. Hallelujah. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon on our hands and handle of the word of life. For the life was manifested, and we have seen it. Now these men, what they're talking about here, John especially, he says, we saw the life. We were with Jesus Christ. We saw Jesus Christ. We saw this life manifested in mortal body. And we knew that it was something different from a different realm. And what we saw, we liked. We handled Him. We were with Him. And we enjoyed it. And we appreciated it. And we know He was different. So He goes on. Which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon in our hands of handle of the Word of life. For the life was manifested and we have seen it and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. So there had to be something in Him that they had to manifest. And there's got to be something in you that has to be manifested. Now holding that scripture and going back to 1 John 3, 
Look what he says here. And we know that he was manifested in the fifth verse of 1 John 3, 5. You know that he was manifested to take away our sins. If he can't take away my sins, then this living in Jesus Christ or this gospel is no better than the old covenant. Come on. If what God has given to us today under new covenant, if it cannot change our lives, if it cannot keep us free from sin, if it does not take those things out like spirits of inheritance, which we had nothing to do with, and all of those other things, then it is no better. It's an impotent gospel, and it's no better than the old covenant. But it's different today. And you that believe, you that are believing this, are finding out that you do not have to walk around with the hang-ups with those sicknesses and those things. You say, well, I still have sicknesses. But as we move deeper into Jesus Christ and come to know Him, then we'll begin to have more faith, for our faith will increase, and we'll begin to see sicknesses dissipated and cast out of our lives. I believe that with all of my heart. I believe that we should be walking around free from sin and free from sickness. Come on. If we're not... And if it doesn't happen, then the old covenant was better. Because I read in the Psalms that he took them out and they had shoes that never wore out and they were healed. Their only problem was they kept sinning because they couldn't help it. That's why God in his, God says he winked at their ignorance. He winked at the errors of the people because he knew there was a better day coming when there were better promises and better hope and a better way of living. And so Jesus came and manifested this better way and said, if you like it, you can have it. But you must believe. Now, he goes on here. He was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Well, that can't be right. But that's what it says. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Now, let's go back to 1 John. Looking again. Here at the first chapter. Chapter 1, 1 John, verse 4. These things, or verse 3, that which we have seen and heard, declare we unto you that you also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father. And he goes on, and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And this comes through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. That brings us into fellowship. Now, these things write we unto you. That's your what? Oh, can't be. Must mean sadness. Must mean self-pity or something. No. He says that your joy may be full. Brother, we have Christians that have no joy because they have hang-ups of depression, insanity, suicidal tendencies, manic depression, all of these things that are working on the inside, and you ask them, oh, you have this abundant life, Jesus, that I am come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. You ask them, do they have it? They look at you and say, I'm just hanging on. And if things get any worse, I'm going to have a breakdown. In fact, I've earned it. Come on. Well, then if that's the case, what's, what's going on with this gospel? What's happening here? He says that your joy may be full. This then is the message which we have heard of him. And declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say, if we say that we have fellowship with him. Now that's important. And you can only have fellowship with him as you abide in him. You grieve the Holy Spirit of God and you find how much fellowship you don't have. Let's bring it right down to where we live. Husband and wife relationship. You do something or say something to your wife or wife to the husband and you grieve either husband or wife, you have just broken fellowship. Right? In fact, I know some of the men go sleep in a bathtub for three days. Go sleep in a bathtub. You know, they have a fight with their wife and the wife says, get out, you're not sleeping in my bed, so he goes in the bathroom and sleeps. Broken fellowship. Because something has happened to grieve either the wife or the husband. And if you continue to grieve each other, eventually you quench whatever love was there between each other. And so it works in the spirited realm. If we are going to have fellowship with God and His Son Jesus Christ through the Spirit, 
then we must continuously abide in Him and have fellowship with Him. And if we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, what a liar! Don't tell me you have fellowship with God Almighty and Jesus Christ through the Spirit when you're walking in darkness and you're doing things that are sinful. Don't tell me you have fellowship. Never happened, brother. Or we can put the facade on and wear the veneer and all of this business, but I'm telling you, the Bible says you're a liar. And this is what the Scripture says. All right? If we say we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we lie, and we do not the truth. Now, but if, and it's all conditional, if we walk in the light, and you can only walk in the light as you abide in the Spirit, so as we walk in the light, as He is in the light, what happens? We have fellowship, one with the other, one with another, and as we are walking in abiding and living in Jesus Christ, something is happening. Just like it's happening here at this campground. What? The blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, is doing what? Cleansing us. Deliverance. Cleansing us from some sin. You see, as you and I walk and abide and live in the anointing and fellowship with Him and with one another... It goes right back now to the washing of each other's walk. His blood and the Spirit of God begins to work within us, and His blood begins to cleanse us from all sin on the inside. We need the cleansing. That's why in 1 John 3, he says, if you have this hope that Christ is doing something inside, you're going to purify yourself. And if you purify yourself, then you're going to live and abide in the anointing. And as you live and abide and walk in Jesus Christ, His blood is continually working to bring to the surface and cleanse out those things that you were programmed with under the old Adam. Now, if we say we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we lie. Then he goes on. The blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. Now, if we say if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. Now, what else does it say? Now, let us sink in. If you have the truth on deliverance, the truth will make you free. So, if you have that truth on deliverance, and it lives in your heart, then you are saying, I have sin there. There's sin in my life. But we have people in churches that say, oh no, I don't have any sin, why, God's forgiven me. Yes, He has. But there must be a remission and a cleansing of it. And that's what He's saying. He's writing to God's people, brother. He's not talking to the unsaved. He's saying here, if we say, if you and I say we have no sin, and that's exactly what blaspheming against the Holy Ghost is. What it is, is that when you see the Holy Spirit delivering somebody else from spirits, and you stand back and say, that's not God. That's the devil. He says, that's blasphemy, and you'll get no deliverance yourself. There's no kind of deliverance for you, because the deliverance must come through the Holy Spirit. But if you say it's not, and there's no such thing as deliverance, then what you're really saying is that there's no deliverance for you, and you'll never get it. God showed me that, and when God showed me that in Revelation, He had dropped it into my mind one day I was studying. Just out of the blue, He dropped it in. And I did not know that one of our men who works at Douglas Aircraft in our, in our city, he had been battling with the devil that day, and the devil was telling him because he had mocked tongues and Pentecost and all of this business, and you know the traditional theory, that he had done this before he was a Christian, and he had committed the unpardonable sin. And I didn't know that he was battling this thing all day. And God that day knew it, and so God dropped in the revelation of what blasphemy of the Holy Ghost was, and I was teaching that night on a Wednesday night Bible study, and all of a sudden I said, oh, I want to share something with God shared with me today, and I threw it out and almost blew this guy away. He, just, he, just, uh, he said, I was battling this today, and I didn't know what to do. But he'd been going through deliverance. He wasn't denying what the Holy Ghost was doing in people's lives. When deliverance comes... And you stand back, and by God help the Pentecostal people that stand back and say, that's the devil, that's not of God. What they are doing is they are saying, if that's not of God, then the deliverance they need, they'll never get. That's what they're saying. This is why he's saying here, if you say, I, you have no sin. I prayed for a man in, 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 the, in the Philippines who was a pastor, had a healthy church. I mean, it was a large church. He was a good man, 
And when he heard the message of deliverance, some of his people in the crusade began to come and get set free. And I have never seen so much witchcraft and demon power come out of Pentecostal people in all my life. And this stuff was resident on the inside. And when these people heard about it, that they had resident spirits there, and, and, and that if they'd been inoculated by witchcraft or drank potions or been offered to Satan as a baby, or their parents were in witchcraft and they had these spirits inside, they began to come and God began to deliver them and set them free. Well, the pastor, he said to me as he brought us over to dinner, he said, I've got to have deliverance. He took me into his office. I laid hands on him. And out of that pastor came a spirit of premeditated murder. He had tried to kill his wife before he was a Christian. He had premeditated murder to get rid of his wife. And the guilt and the condemnation and the accusing spirits were inside, plus that spirit of premeditated murder, plus a few other things that were in his life. And I saw this pastor, who had a large church with a large congregation, throwing up in his office all the garbage that Satan had put into his life. If we say, this is what he's talking about, if we say that we have no sin, we are only deceiving ourselves, brother. And that's exactly why it's so hard to get to the churches. Would you believe it? When I was pastoring in the Washington, D.C. area, we had some coming from the Pentagon and the Enders Air Force Base and, and different places. Two of my best people, wonderful people, and you know them because I've mentioned their names, they ran off to a Derek Prince meeting in New York. And when they came back, it was on a Wednesday night and the fellow came in with his wife and he happened to be an attorney and he said, man, I'm going to change your theology. And I said, you're going to change my theology? And he said, yes. He said, my wife was up there at Derek Prince's meeting and he laid hands on her and she got set free and he began to name the areas that, that uh, she would be delivered from in this Derek Prince meeting. And I said, you're out of your mind. I said, that's nothing more than psychology. Yeah, but he said, she threw up and all this. I said, well, she possibly saw the people throwing up and I began to argue with this lawyer, and we sat in the car for two hours, and I finally convinced him that it was all psychological, and that his wife never received deliverance, and that she should fast and pray, and, and, and ask God to forgive her. And she did. And she went back into bondage. But when God met me six years ago, they were the first people I called. And I said, I want, number one, to ask your forgiveness. And she said, you were my pastor, and I believed what you said. And she said, I went back into bondage, and after you left the church and went back to Canada, she said, I had to go someplace else to receive deliverance again. I'm telling you, there's a lot of power that comes from the pulpit. Yes. And it's that power that has put the people of God in bondage. And we are deceiving ourselves. God has forgiven us, just as He did under Old Covenant with the children of Israel. But there's something different in the new covenant. He has placed in us <clears throat> his spirit that produces life so that he says, now you know you've committed sin, but he says, I'm going to get it out of you. Not only will I forgive you, but I'm going to ream it out through the power of the Holy Spirit called circumcision by the Spirit, and I'll clean you out of the inside, and I'll build my spirit so that my spirit will take over all inside your mortal body and give you life. That's power. And so we go on. Then he says in verse 9. Now you'll notice in verse 8 of 1 John chapter 1, <clears throat> if we say we have no sin, we're deceiving ourselves. So you can sit in deliverance meetings. You can say it's not true. You can say I don't believe it. But all you're doing is deceiving yourself. That's like running around in Christian science and having a sickness and saying, well, I'm really not sick. It's mind over matter. And I always say, well, yes, it doesn't mind. And I, I don't mind and it really doesn't matter, does it? Mind over matter. But what is happening? You're deceiving yourself. And people deceive themselves because they're in organization and they look at the size of the church and they look at the size of the choir and all of this business and they say, well, God, look what God's in this place. Look what God's doing in our church. Why, we've just had 20, 30 souls come to Jesus Christ and we have 500 in Sunday school or 1,000 in Sunday school and we're, our budget is $200,000. Well, that doesn't tell me anything. I'll send you to a Roman Catholic church is a lot bigger than the Assemblies of God. 
I can send you to some Buddhist temples that are a lot bigger than the Assemblies of God or any other fundamental evangelical works. That doesn't tell me something. What tells me is what is happening in my life, how I am living, and what my family is receiving and how they are living. That tells me whether God's working in revival in my life. And so he goes on in verse 8. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. Now look the last part. And the truth is not in us. So he says, if the truth is in you, you'll know you have sin. Right? He said, that's what he's saying. He said, if the truth is in you, you will not deceive yourself. You will say, yes, Lord, I know there are things on the inside. And because of that truth, I'll be made free from those things. Now, verse 9. If we confess. Now look, people take this out of context, but look what he's saying. The very first word of verse 9 is if. If we confess our sins, what happens? He is faithful and just to forgive, and the word forgive here is to remit. Now what did he say to his disciples? When you go out, whosoever sins you remit, are remitted. So they must have gone out preaching deliverance. I laid, I had a couple that are coming from the Roman Catholic Charismatic Group. Now they're coming in slow. But the reason, about two years ago, uh, a young 700 club put me in touch with a, a young boy because the father who was Roman Catholic had called 700 club and told, him, told them his boy had a problem. And so they said, well, you get in contact with Brother Leroy. And so he called me. And this young boy was 11 years of age. His mother was a Christian, evangelical. The young boy had given his life to Jesus Christ. Now, I want to I bring out a principle here. The mother had taken this young 11-year-old boy to a Pentecostal church to hear a 10-year-old boy preach. Now, I'm going to ask you something. You don't have to answer me, but I do not think. Any ten-year-old boy can teach you anything. All right? And they stood this boy up on a chair behind the pulpit because many of our churches have gone into sensationalism or Hollywood evangelism. And they stood him up there. He was already programmed by his parents. And all he did was parrot what they had placed in him. As he preached, or whatever he did in that church that sat a thousand people, and everybody had to get there because they wanted to see this phenomenon of a young boy, ten years of age, preaching on a chair, and matured Christians, or should have been matured Christians, who should have known that this wasn't going to do the work of God any good whatsoever. Just like magicians, and Christian magicians, and Christian puppet shows, and what's it all for? To build the church, and get the crowd... Hollywood evangelism, brother. And so this young 11-year-old boy was sitting in the pew. And as he sat there in this Pentecostal church, God spoke to him. And God spoke to him in his ear and said, Would you like to be a preacher, a boy preacher like him? And this boy being in church, he said, Yes, Lord. Now I've got news for you. Number one, it was not God that spoke to him. And so this young boy, he went home. He continued to go to these meetings that following week. A friend of his down the street brought a Ouija board up. They played together. That night, this boy, who was a Christian boy, he had nightmares. And somehow he realized that his nightmares were related to the Ouija board that he had played that day. So he took the Ouija board and next morning took it down to the garage and broke it up in pieces. As he finished going to these series of meetings, he came home one Sunday afternoon and was laying on his bed and God spoke to him again and said, Would you still like to be a preacher like the boy you've heard? And this young fellow said, Yes, God, I would. And this was a story that was related to me because I prayed for this boy. He said, As I laid there on my bed, suddenly I felt ten feet tall. Something came into me. He said, I just felt ten feet tall. Well, from that moment, that boy began to go out and tell the neighborhood children and parents about hell, heaven, rapture, getting saved, being born again. This is all he did. He just went around the neighborhood. 
he was scaring the neighbors, he was scaring the kids he was playing with, and his Roman Catholic father, he didn't understand what was going on, and he thought, well, it's only going to last for four days, but it was going for four months, and so he phoned 700 Club, and then he called me. As he shared the story with me on the telephone, the Spirit of God spoke to me and said, that is a religious spirit. Brother, you don't think spirits can get in church? They're all in church. Why, they sing with the best of God's people. And you know what they do? They prophesy with the best of God's people. And they speak in tongues with the best of God's people. And God's people get blessed because they don't know the difference and have no discernment as to what is demon power and what is the Holy Ghost. And so this young boy, I said to his father, well, you bring him the next, and this is a falling night, you and your wife come, bring him over and we'll pray for him. They arrived the following night, this young fellow, handsome little boy, he sat in the living room and I said, now Raymond, I said, what's God telling you to do? He said, God's telling me to preach. And he began to speak to me of what God was telling him. And brother, for a minute I sat there astounded and thought, my God, maybe I'm wrong. Because the devil was telling him, he said, Raymond, you're like a cup and I'm a teapot. And he said, I want to fill you full. But he said, there are some Christians who do not want to be filled full. But he said, I know you want to be filled full. But you see, he was going to fill him full of the wrong spirit. And so I said, well, where do you feel this, Raymond? He said, I feel it down in here like a burning fire. So I said to this young boy, I said, Raymond, what if that's not the right spirit? Would you like to get rid of it? And he said, yes, I would. So I said, all right, come on with me. So I took him into the bathroom and I laid hands on him. And I never saw any manifestation. So I said to him after I prayed, did anything happen, Raymond? What did you feel? He said, yes, it's gone. I said, what's gone? He said, well, when you prayed for me, he said, something left from here and went out like a puff of air. Well, I thought, that sounds pretty, pretty good. So I said, well, come on back in. And I said, you tell your mother and father what's happened. So he sat down with his mother and dad. And as he sat down, I said, now, Raymond, I said, what's God telling you to do? He said, God's telling me to preach. So I said, now, I thought you told me that it left. Oh, he said, it, he said I don't feel it here anymore. But he said, I hear it out here. And so I went over and I laid hands on him and I commanded that religious spirit to completely leave this boy's life and trouble him no more. And as I was praying for him, he looked up at his mother and said, he said, now I am suspicious. And she said, why, Raymond? He said, because it's hollering at me as it goes. Now, I've met that father since and that boy is completely normal. No problem whatsoever. Now, because of that, this priest was introduced to me because he was charismatic and was interested in deliverance. And so he brought to me two of his parishioners for deliverance. Both of these people were having marital problems. They were leaders in the charismatic group, but they were having problems because the husband had had an extracurricular activity uh, outside of his home before he was a Christian and when he would walk in late his wife would become suspicious and start to penetrate with probing words and begin to work on him and work on him till a spirit of fear of his wife came into him. And so this priest knowing they had marital problems brought them to our place and God delivered him from a spirit of fear of his wife and she got deliverance from a spirit of bitterness and resentment and suspicion. And I never saw them for a whole year. And I knew from experience that deliverance is not a whole thing all at once. Do you understand that? It's a progressive work of God. And you must not get discouraged because deliverance will come to you today and you will walk it out. And when you have walked it out and you are grounded and settled and established at that level, then God will allow something else to come by and all of a sudden you'll see that you need more deliverance. So don't get discouraged. All he's doing is he's helping you to mature and grow and bring you into the fullness of God. And finally, these people called me again and just recently they have gone through more cleansing. Now I felt better. But you see, they were deceiving themselves. They thought that deliverance was one cure-all, the panacea for everything, the cure-all for everything, that once they got hands laid on and received the laying on of hands and certain spirits left, that everything was going to be fine. Well, I have news for you that when you get deliverance, everything's not going to be fine. You're going to find that some things get a little worse. Now, isn't that a wonderful way to preach a positive gospel? 
Doesn't that build your faith up? But what's happening? You're feeling peace on the inside. You're feeling fine on the inside. What is happening that you're not feeling so fine on the outside? Your standing will never change, but your state will become a fluctuating. It'll start to fluctuate because your circumstances revolve or in, and you're involved in your circumstances and they will try to disrupt your state. For instance, when you get uh, your son or your daughter and they have to have a little problem with you and you suddenly take the Board of Education to the seat of intelligence, why then suddenly they find their state has changed. They don't feel so good on the seat of intelligence anymore. They kind of feel dislocated. Why? Because something has happened. But their standing hasn't changed. They're still your son or they're still your daughter. But what has happened? The circumstances have changed something and something has happened and you've tried to correct the problem. And so God does the same with us. He tries to correct the problem. And so he tells us, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, if we say in verse 10 of 1 John 1 that we have not sinned, it's in past tense. Now, how many know they have sinned? All right. Before you came to Jesus Christ, you know you had sinned. How many know they have sinned since they've come to Jesus Christ? Terrific. Terrific. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. And so when the truth comes and we realize that, yes, Lord, I sinned in the past and there are things still on the inside that are causing me to sin now, God says, terrific, you've just received the truth. And if you'll continue to move on into that truth and don't be moved away from it, the truth will make you free and this hope that one day the righteousness of Jesus Christ and the image of Jesus Christ will manifest through your life, he said, then you'll just keep on keeping on. But people get discouraged because of the problems they have, because they come to Jesus Christ, because the truth is not preached. We have Christians that give their lives to the Lord Jesus. They serve the Lord sometimes six months, a year, five years, ten years. Something happens. Something activates on the inside. And they call, we call it backsliding. And they go out the back door. And if there's a bad board member, like our sister was saying, that's full of the devil, then the pastor says, I've had all I can take of this joker. And so they say, let's get rid of him. So they excommunicate him, put him to the door and boot him out. That's not what God wants. What God wants is if the truth is preached, that board member that's full of the devil will go through deliverance and become a, a lovely little lamb. Come on, I listen, I, I've had... I've counseled, I've had enough churches and counseled enough of those board members and I would cry over these men, cry over the marital problems and, and, and no answers. Saying, well, and you've been there, husband and wife, trying to move into God and the husband bitter and resentful and maybe beats his wife and then he says he's sorry and he can't understand his temper, he got it from his grandfather or his dad and so they come for counseling and you sit there and say, well, brother, just keep praying about it. And you've got to read the Bible more. And, and, and when it comes, you've just got to get down. You've got to pray more. And you've got to keep coming to church. And don't forsake the assembling of yourself together. Not anymore do I do that. Brother, I grab him, stick him in the office, and say, you need deliverance. Hallelujah. And lay hands on them. That spirit of anger comes out. They walk out free, feel they've lost some weight. And I say, you have. And they go out shouting and praising the Lord. And husband and wife have come together. That's the answer, brother. That's the answer. It's the truth that makes us free. So he says, my little children, in chapter 2 of 1 John 1, my little children, these things write I unto you, that you what? Sin sometimes. No, sin not. He's written these things. He's telling us. He said, I'm writing this, that you sin not. But, and if any man sin. And we have this because when that spirit activates, when the enemy brings, or, or God allows the enemy to bring a certain situation around, then when it comes and we sin, then we have an intercession with the Father Jesus Christ the righteous, and then we go through deliverance, and when we leave, we never do it again. Now hear me. When you get deliverance in your life, from certain areas that God's delivering you from, you should not ever sin again in that area. You say, how do you know? Because I know. I've had deliverance. 
And one of my greatest deliverance, which is I'm not going to say publicly, but when it happened through divine intervention, I have never had a problem in that area again. Now, my men in our church know I've shared it. Our men stand up in a deliverance service. Fifty or sixty men, they'll stand up. And we'll share these areas with them, and they'll share the areas that God set them free, and other men that have come in for deliverance, when they see men of God saying, yes, I have this problem or that problem, then they stand up and say, yes, I have it too. Lay hands on me. But you should never have that problem. You say, well, don't you get tempted? Well, the devil's tired of tempting me too in that area. He came back the first few months and knocked on the outside and said, hey, I want to get back in. I said, stay out where you are. I had enough trouble when you were here. Stay outside. And he stopped knocking. And but I, he that thinketh, he standeth, take heed lest he fall. And so I keep myself guarded. Keep in the anointing. Keep the blood where it belongs. Keep in the word of God, brother. Because that keeps the devil out. And so he says he is the propitiation for our sins or the atonement. And not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. And hereby we do know that we know him. If we keep His commandments, how do we know we know Him? Because we keep His commandments. And it's so much easier to keep His commandments. It's so much easier to love. It's so much easier to have God working and moving in your life because of what He has done in deliverance. Now, I just want to close. My, I've never seen time go so fast. What do you have down here? Fast time? I mean, it is unreal, brother. I mean, this is something else. That's what it is. <laughs> I was smelling some food, I think. I didn't have any breakfast. Anyway, First John 5. First John 5. Hallelujah. First John 5. Now look what he says. Chapter 1. Whosoever, again, whosoever, believeth that Jesus is the Christ or the anointing is what? It also means delivered. It's delivered of God. It also means delivered. When a woman brings birth to a baby, she gives birth, but she's delivered. When you and I get set free from spirits, we give birth, but we are delivered. That spirit's gone. And so we find out here, and everyone that loveth him that beget, loveth him also that is begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we what? Love God and keep His commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep His commandments. How can I keep His commandments if I have anger? How can I keep His commandments if I have unforgiveness? How can I keep His commandments if I have envy or greed or lust? So what God is saying, to do something I cannot do unless He has brought provision that I can do it. And the provision was that He put His Spirit on the inside to set us free from these things so we could keep His commandments because He'll never tell us to do something that He will not help us to do. Then He goes on. For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not burdensome or grievous. For whatsoever is delivered of God overcometh the world. Brother... I have been delivered from God and in God, and I overcome the world in many, many areas. And as God continues to deliver me, whosoever is born of God does not, what? Commit sin. Isn't that what the Scripture says? In verse 18 of, of, second, of uh, 1 John 5, we know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not. Now, I know there are other applications, but what God showed me, that this word born means delivered. So, we know that whosoever is delivered of God sinneth not. So, when you get set free from violence, you will never have violence again unless you willfully allow it to come in. You say, is that scriptural? You better believe it. Turn with me. To, I told you this was the last scripture. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26. For if we sin, what's the next word? Willfully. Willfully. Now look what the rest of the scripture says. After that we have received the knowledge of the truth. Now when we receive the knowledge of the truth of deliverance, 
and we go through deliverance, and that Spirit is taken out of us, then before we can have that Spirit come back in, we must willfully, voluntarily transgress and let it in. Now let it sink in. If God sets you free from masturbation, and I'll use that because it's been a big problem with a lot of young people, when that Spirit goes, then you are free from it, and there is no reason for you to masturbate. But, if you allow a provocative spirit to move you into pornography, and you willfully, voluntarily look at pornography, then it will cause a stimulation, and before you know it, Satan is around your mind saying, why don't you? And that works with any area that you're free from. You get into a hassle and you say you've had, say you have a, t a problem of, of uh, a grudge spirit. And there's such thing as grudge spirits. You and your husband, you maybe you've had battles all your life. Now you've come to Jesus Christ. He's forgiven you for your sins. The time comes, you've learned about deliverance and now you're getting deliverance. And so you've gotten rid of all the grudge spirits and the bitternesses and the unforgiveness. But suddenly Satan sets a situation up. And when he sets the situation up, you have the choice now, because of the government of God in you, you have the choice with your will to submit it to the government of God in you, to the will of God. And when that situation comes up, you can either become bitter and say, I'm going to hold a grudge against him because I just want to hold a grudge. But if God has set you free from grudge spirits, then you have to willfully, voluntarily let that thing back in. Understand it? If we sin willfully, for if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. Where in the world are you going to go? Once you've had deliverance and you willfully, voluntarily sin in those areas that God sets you free from, then where are you going to go for deliverance? You've said that Jesus Christ and His power and blood wasn't sufficient to keep it out. And you don't care anyway, and that old don't care spirit takes over, and you say, well, what's the difference? And so he says, then eventually, you'll just become an apostate. What I am saying is that God's new covenant brings abundant life, brings us the kingdom of God is not meat nor drink, but righteousness, peace, and joy, where? In the Holy Ghost. And so as you and I go through the cleansing that God has for us, and as we allow and keep the devil out, we'll walk around with righteousness that's been given to us through the impartation of the Spirit bringing it to us. And with that righteousness will come peace. And with that peace will come joy. And with that joy will come abundant life in this mortal body, in this world, now. And people will look at us and say, My, I want what they have. I want it. You say, is that scriptural? Yes. That's the way Jesus lived. And people looked and said, I like it. I want it. Father, we bow our hearts this morning. We give you praise and thanksgiving for the truth of the Word of God. We thank you for this new covenant. For truly it has been built on better promises a better hope. Lord, it's so much better. It's so much higher. And there's so much life in it that all we can do is say, Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father, for this infinite plan, for this great wisdom, for your omniscience and your omnipresence and all that you've done and are doing for us. Father, even though we know we're not worthy, we love it. We love it. We know, Father, that you spoil us. You've spoiled us with the good things from your table. But the problem is being, Father, that the church and the error and the false doctrines and the false prophets have moved your people away from the table of our God. Move them away, Father, from the life that you've brought to them. For Satan said, if I cannot fight them, I'll join them. And certainly he has done that, Father. But we thank you today for life. We thank you today for revelation. 
We thank you today for the Word of God is bringing to us the illumination of it, that, Lord, we understand more and more that Calvary was all-powerful, that when you said, it is finished, it was finished, that when you bore our sicknesses and our sins, that truly you did just that. And so we pray that you will increase our faith that we will reach out, Father, and not only get deliverance from the sins that are inside, but get deliverance from the sicknesses that we are bearing in our bodies. And we're asking you, Lord, and we're saying it to you today, increase our faith, for that faith must come to the hearing of your word, and that must be penetrated in our spirits by an arima of the Holy Ghost. And so we pray today, build us up in the Holy Ghost, build us up in the Spirit of God, Bring us to the place of being grounded and settled and unmoved, Father, by those things that are around us. Lord, let not any situation or any circumstance disturb us. Let us be like Paul, for I have learned to be content in whatsoever state I'm in. And Father, whatever the state might be, help us to reach out by the Spirit and have the faith that you have for us, knowing that you are on the inside and that you know our state, you know our situations, you know our circumstances. And so increase our faith. And my God, may deliverances be wrought and miracles be wrought in this camp meeting for the glory of your name. Because, Lord Jesus, you've done it for us. You've given it to us. You were the pattern, Son, and you walked around without sin, without sickness. And, Father, if we're to be like you, we must walk around without sin, without sickness. But, Lord, it takes a growing into that faith. It takes a coming into the trust of our Lord Jesus. And so, as we come to know you intimately, then, Lord, the love of God will cast out all the fear and all the doubt and all the unbelief and all the skepticism. And we'll come to that place. We will be so yielded to you and say, yes, Lord, you do what you want to do in our body, soul, and spirit. So have your way, Father, in every heart, in every life. And we'll be pleased to give you the honor and the glory and the praise. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. This is the end of this message. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and LHBC online.com there are many free audio files there it's like going to bible school at home thank you